Hello Sparkshort fans and welcome to the channel. You're about to hear part 2 in a three part saga from the Arrowhead universe, a concept of my own creation. So please, sit back, pull up a chair, or enjoy wherever you can as we delve into the story. Yet, if you like what you hear and would like to find out more from the extended universe, a link will be posted above and at the end of the video. Also, if you would like to hit the like and subscribe button, it's a small thing to ask, but it really helps out the algorithm to know you'd like to listen to more and help in growing the channel. Again, thank you. And now, on with the story. I'm telling you, Glenn, it's not subspace interference. It's definitely out there. Caitlin spoke, looking deep into her readout display trying to make sense of not only a mass that kept appearing and disappearing on the far edge of her radar screen, but also what it could be. I'm telling you, you're jumping at shadows. You know what the belt's like. A rogue wandering asteroid could be deflecting sensor readings. Trust me, nothing is out there except rock. Glenn replied nonchalantly. Caitlin swiveled her station's chair around to look at him, a late twenty-year-old man, blonde medium-length flowing hair, facial features rugged yet stoic, wearing an ocean blue spacer's uniform. He was the ideal spacer, coming through the academy on Lunar Gateway, someone who should be focused and committed, and could have easily and quickly rose through the ranks and made captain or senior rank aboard either a research or a colony ship. Yet somehow he had found his way here to Observatory Relay 17, a wayward post situated within the inner solar system's asteroid belt. The station was built primarily to either boost transmissions from either mining platforms on the many floating rocks in the belt back to Earth or Lunar Gateway, along with the listening posts and vessels further out towards the fringes of the solar system. Caitlin was a committed young woman, having always had a fascination with space and wanting to challenge herself in an extreme environment, and felt that going into space would give her that opportunity. The posting, however, was anything but challenging, a mundane task that any Tom, Dick or Harry could just as easily do. And yet, this posting was to be a stepping stone in advancing her career, to hopefully find herself posted to a science and research vessel once her stint here was over. She wanted this posting, but as she focused on Glenn, resting his feet up on his console, arms folded behind his head, looking more than a little bored, she couldn't help but wonder what he'd done to end up posted out here. It's got to be more than just a rogue wandering asteroid. This reading, whatever it is, has been here for the past few hours. Caitlin spoke, fixing a mat of autumn brown hair that had fallen in front of her face behind her right ear. Glenn gazed at the starfield, watching the various hulking masses of rock that had been left over from the formation of the solar system, floating, caught in the continual tug of war between Jupiter and Mars, at times block out the starlight before returning soon after. He'd gotten used to this over the years he'd been posted, or more like given no other option but to accept the posting as a form of keeping him out of the way. But Glenn saw it as Lunar Gateway trying to erase him from history by sending him out to this relay station deep down he knew that somehow, some way, the powers that be would find some loophole to extend his stay, hoping he'd rot here or out on one of the outer fringes listening posts in the heliosphere. It was no secret that he thought he'd never see Earth again, at least not in person. The closest he would now ever get would be either the pictures in his collection or his mind, Yet he wanted to bury the ones in his mind as far deep as he could. The feelings even now, after all these years, 
was still raw and haunted him so. Look, Caitlin, you get used to the sensor ghosts and asteroid echoes after a while of being here. Trust me, that's all this is, Glenn replied, coming to meet her look. How long have you been here, Glenn? I'm sure you're due for a rotation soon, Caitlin quipped. What can I say? I like the place, Glenn retorted in a callous tone. Just curious. You were here when I arrived two years ago, and rotations are every couple of years, so I assumed someone would be changing with you, Caitlin asked. Don't know what to tell you, other than not many people want relay station postings, Glenn answered. You never talk about yourself. I tried getting a hold of your file to find out something, anything, but everything after five years ago is classified. So I got to ask, is that how long you've been here? She asked, watching for any telltale signs as she spoke, wondering if she'd hit on something. Yet it seemed that Glenn was well trained in guarding his feelings and emotions, as he didn't flinch, not even once, except to go back to looking out at the asteroid field again. You want me to talk? Okay. Better take a look at your sensor panel again. He said, having noticed while she'd been speaking to him, the blip mass had once again vanished. Damn it! Caitlin exclaimed, noticing the same thing now. With a grin and chuckle, Glenn kicked his feet off the station, making to stand, while keeping his arms and hands crossed behind his back. Okay, I'm going to go get something to eat, and I'll let you hunt for your sensor ghost some more, he gestured, walking away out of the room. He couldn't believe that Caitlin had had the nerve to go snooping into his personal files behind his back. Yet at the same time, he had to give her props. She'd done more than his last relay partner. They'd never asked, or maybe they knew, having been at Lunar Gateway at the time, so didn't need to. Either way, their relationship had been cold and almost boorish. At least Caitlin had tried, which was more than anyone else had. Perhaps he might be able to confide in her. Yet still, maybe not. As the hours passed, Glenn spent time spotting the odd communication between the asteroid mining rigs, listening posts and lunar gateway. The messages were always the same. Updates on ore extraction, shipments and supplies, and the odd case of a possible down transmitter on listening post 22, out around the heliosphere. All the while, Caitlin amplified the boost gain so that the messages got to their intended destinations while still searching for this blip mass. Glenn had to hand it to Caitlin. She was nothing if not persistent. Yet that night, as he slept, his dreams found himself drifting away from Observation Relay 17 and back to Lunar Gateway. He was back in the moment, traversing the lunar surface in his shuttle, zipping, dipping and climbing throughout the potted craters and crevasses that lined the surface. He was there with the love of his life, Mary, beside him. He made these runs before, and knew every inch of the surface like the back of his hand. He was safe, and she was with him. At least, that had been the case. During a somewhat stupid turn of events, in which they had had a bit too much to drink, and things had led to others, they had found themselves in one of the shuttles, flying over the surface. Glenn had intended to propose to Mary while in the Atkin Basin, the moon's largest crater, located at the lunar south pole. Yet as fate would have it, they didn't arrive. During a rather adrenaline fueled rush, dipping into a crater, Mary had obscured Glenn's view, having come to sit with him as they shared an intimate moment. A loose rock slide caught them unawares, until it was too late. As Glenn pulled the shuttle up hard, to avoid being buried, the ship clipped the rock wall, damaging systems and ending up crashing. 
both had been wearing spacesuits, but neither had worn their helmets. As Glenn came to from the impact, warning lights in the cockpit blared around him, that he saw Mary, face down on the floor, her spacesuit ripped and blooded. Worse still, the force of the impact had shattered the hardened glass window. Even now, he could see it breaking. In mere moments, the cockpit would be in the vacuum of space. Quickly, he found his helmet and placed it on, securing it as the pain cracked ever faster. Fumbling around, he located Mary's, while the pain through his body tried to prevent him and hindered his movements. It was, however, as he grabbed it, the window broke. He quickly applied the helmet, but it was too late. When the rescue crews found them, he was still cradling Mary's lifeless body. As they pulled him away from her, he let out a scream, yanking him forcefully back to reality. As he sat up in his bed, the sweat was dripping from him. His heart was beating fast, and he had difficulty catching his breath. He checked his watch, which displayed half five. He proceeded to shower, trying to wipe that dream from his mind. Yet it was the same one every night. He was locked into an endless loop. If only he hadn't been so stupid. Maybe if they'd have been more careful, or had watched out for the rock falls, Mary would still be alive. Either way, his mind was completely restless. Perhaps it was all down to the fact that he couldn't forgive himself. Or maybe his mind was telling him to let go, and that there was nothing else that could be done. Either way, she was dead, and he wasn't, and he needed to lay that ghost to rest somehow. Soon after readying himself for another shift, he met Caitlin on deck. He wondered if she'd heard his screams. Either way, he didn't want to talk about it. But as he wandered onto the main command area, she not only looked concerned, but deep at work, her head buried deep into not only a message she was reading, but also, every so often, she would look back to another, darting between the two, typing commands furiously into them. Morning. Found something interesting? He inquired. Just adding a new layer of mystery to our disappearing blip mass, she answered. Already? This is a new record even for that. It doesn't normally show itself to at least 11 station time, Glenn mused. Not wrong in what he was saying, but even so, Caitlin wasn't joking. Her expression didn't change, and not only that, this was new for her, but also troubled him. Seriously, what is it? he asked. I sent a message out to the rig on AJ-437, asking about the blip as they were the closest to it, Caitlin stated. And? And? It's not a sensor ghost, or asteroid echo. It's a ship, Caitlin answered. No way. Can't be, Glenn answered. But Caitlin moved away from her station, offering Glenn to come and check it out for himself. As he did, he saw the image that the rig had taken from one of the orbital satellites around it. The more he looked, the more he could make out it was a ship, and a class they both knew very well. That's the arrowhead. Glenn spoke, puzzled as to why it was out there. I've been cross-checking to try and clean up the image, to get a better look at it, and sent out hails, but I'm getting nothing back, Caitlin said. Figures. I wonder which one it could be, Glenn answered, rubbing his chin. True. Do you think it might be the venture? Caitlin asked. Could be, but I can't see how. It disappeared in here, sure, but that was over 50 years ago. Most people assume it's been pulverized by asteroids. Still, a chance to end that mystery might be worth a look. 
I'll start prepping the Trent. See if you can find anything else before we head out, Glenn spoke. The DSV Trent was the observation station's only means of transport between itself and the mining rigs, much like the venture which both Caitlin and Glenn assumed the picture to be was. The Trent was also an arrowhead class of ship, except instead of being continually on the move on a four-year basis, the ship was permanently docked and readied at the station in case of an evacuation of a rig that was needed. Both of them knew of the arrowhead's strange cases of disappearing, yet never in the history of it happening had one ever been found or come back. So this presented a unique opportunity to close the case on one of the fleet's oldest mysteries. The Trent itself was by no means a newer ship. It had been in service for close to 40 years, yet mostly just at the asteroid belt station in close contact between the observation posts and the rigs, so that if it went missing, someone would know about it early on. The old ship had a set of replacement parts kept at the station, yet due to Glenn's placement there, it was deemed that any newer models would be declined until it was desperately needed. It took them a couple of hours to reach the rig on AJ-437. Once they had checked in, they discovered that they were in the process of sending a probe out to the ship, but with them now in the area, it was deemed unneeded. Having left the rig, they proceeded further out, locating the vessel just outside of the belt, having come into view from behind a rather large asteroid which had been obscuring it. Wow, look at it. Caitlin gasped in awe, happy to be vindicated that she'd been right that this wasn't just a sensor ghost. It's like looking back in a mirror image, Glenn added. Okay, first things first. Let's see if this is a venture before doing anything else. Glenn continued, slowly creeping the Trent closer as he sat in the pilot's seat. Both of them sat, looking at the missing arrowhead class ship. From what they could tell, the ship was just drifting, or floating. The cockpit area was completely empty and totally dark. As Glenn made a pass of the venture, their hearts sank, but also confused them more so. The ship they had found wasn't the venture, but the arrowhead Callisto. Well, this just throws up a whole new set of questions. Glenn spoke, unsure of what to say. Just checking if we have anything on the Callisto, Caitlin replied, bringing up files and data from her station positioned just behind the pilot. Her long autumn brown hair was continually falling in front of her eyeline as she cross-referenced and double-checked her findings, that it was beginning to irritate her so much so that she had to stop at one point and tie her hair back into a ponytail. Continuing her search, eventually, however, she came across the file in question. Here we go. DSV Callisto. Long range scout, yada yada yada. Last known whereabouts from command is that they were on a supply run to listening post 22, out in the heliosphere, she said, relaying the information to him. The heliosphere? That's a long way out. Does it say who was on board? Glenn inquired. One moment. Haley and Rick Daunton. Caitlin answered. The couple? Man, what happened to them? Glenn spoke out loud. You know them? Caitlin asked, shooting him a look. Not by face, only name. They ran a few communications every so often between us in various places, mainly Lunar Gateway or the listening posts. Man, this one bites. He told her. The question still remains, however. What happened to them? Caitlin said, still checking the data on the Callisto. Any clues?
Glenn asked, hoping, praying to lay some ghosts to rest. Nothing. Their last transmission was to Lunar Gateway before arriving at listening post 22. After that, nothing, Caitlin said, her heart sinking that they might not get the answers they needed to solve the mystery. Can you link up with the Callisto's computer? See if you can get some information, Glenn proposed, knowing that if they could get the Callisto's onboard computer to provide them with answers, they might be able to bring closure to this story without the need to dock and perform a manual link-up. Caitlin began the process of trying to link up the Callisto's main computer. Yet every time she tried, the system would bring back an error command. In frustration, she slammed her hands against the console and sat back, placing her hands on her forehead before running them backwards and down her hair. Glenn didn't need to ask. He could see her annoyance through the reflection in the cockpit's window. With a heavy sigh, he knew what was next. Looks like it's the hard way then. Make the preparations for link-up. I'll take care of the coupling. Make sure to bring the auxiliary power unit. I think we're going to need it, he stated, getting a bad feeling about this. In his mind, all Glenn could think about as Caitlin left the cockpit and proceeded to the rear of the ship to begin making a start on getting ready to cross was the disaster he had had on Luna. It had the same vibe, and he just couldn't shake that feeling from his mind, no matter how hard he tried. Everything about this all seemed wrong, and the Callisto wasn't even a troublesome ship. Both Haley and Rick were always communicating and reporting in, and the last time he'd seen them was a few months back when they were originally heading out to listening post 22. So why now was she adrift, and without power, and just what had happened at the listening post? Minutes later, Glenn had successfully docked both the Trent and the Callisto together. He sat for a moment, his head still unsure as to the situation before them. After giving a deep sigh, he left the cockpit and proceeded to join Caitlin at the rear docking hatch. Once he arrived, she was already waiting, kitted out in her spacesuit, holding the auxiliary power unit. Her expression was that of nervousness. Once we get the download up and running, we can come back. I doubt somehow we'll find anyone on board. I only hope that the Callisto was somehow mistakenly uncoupled from the listening post 22. And both Haley and Rick are still alive, Glenn said. We can only hope, Caitlin spoke. Still shitting it inside. Deep breaths. Keep cool. It'll conserve oxygen, Glenn told her, pressing the release command on the hatch as the door opened, revealing the outward hose seal section of the Callisto. Caitlin took more deep breaths. She knew the drill, and had had her training, so Glenn's words weren't new to her. But putting it into practice, going on board what she could only consider to be a ghost ship, still unnerved her no end. That as Glenn activated the hatch release on the Callisto, she let out a gasp of horror as lying crumpled on the floor by the Callisto's inner hatch was a discarded metallic remains of a spacesuit. Guess we can rule out any form of accident, Glenn spoke, his mind now racing towards that of foul play, as there would be no reason for a spacesuit to just be left lying in this fashion on the floor. Yet he knew that there had to be a body somewhere on board. But where? The interior of the Callisto was dark, cold and foreboding. That neither could see more than a few feet in front of them that well at all. As they stood in the entry hatch rear section of the Callisto, they both turned on their suits of beam lights. Take things nice and slow. We don't know what happened here, Glenn told Caitlin, as they cautiously proceeded 
through the ship. Yet, as they left the engineering section and exited into the kitchen dining area, things seemed odd, but they couldn't quite put their fingers on it. On the dining table, a bowl had been set, which most people would put a selection of fruit in. Glenn surmised that even if the Callisto had been adrift, any food would have started to have decayed and have left a residue. However, the bowl was picked clean, making it look as though it had been recently unwrapped. More so that they came across empty plant pots with no plants or soil to speak of. In fact, it seemed all manner of organic matter had been scrubbed clean away. You get the feeling this all seems wrong? Glenn asked. You're only asking that now? Caitlin inquired. Walking on through into the living area, they felt the same. Nothing seemed normal. It was like walking into a spotless vacant property. Only the last occupant had left their belongings and deep cleaned before going. What was even more bizarre was that there weren't any traces of dust particles in the air. Glenn stopped outside the doorway to the cockpit so fast that Caitlin bumped into him. She then saw him turn around with a concerned, almost confused, painted look across his face. What is it? She asked him, almost afraid to ask the question. We've walked through this entire ship from back to front, right? Glenn started. Right? Caitlin spoke, unsurely. We know that we didn't see anyone in the cockpit area. So whose spacesuit was that by the hatch? And where are they now? Glenn questioned. Caitlin looked back. The compartment door to the galley was open, along with the access to the engineering section. And yet Glenn was right. They hadn't come across anyone. No signs of life at all. Maybe they got sucked out into space, or left on the ship in a hurry, or... Caitlin spoke, her mind racing from one possibility to another, trying to fit a narrative for the discarded spacesuit. They can't have been sucked out into space. The rear hatch would have been left open. These old ships weren't automatic. Glenn answered, going back, peering through into the galley. Hello? Anyone here? He called out, waiting on a response, hoping that whomever had left the spacesuit would answer. Yet, as he waited, he got no answer. Okay, this is really starting to creep me out now. Caitlin spoke, her fear rising in her words. Let's get the data and be done with this place. Glenn spoke feeling the same way she did. As they both entered out onto the cockpit, they firstly saw the asteroid belt in front of them. The section was cold and dark and had no signs of life. The area became even more haunting when one of the larger floating hulks of rock cast its shadow inwards, leaving them with only their own beam lights to cut through the darkness. Let's get this done. And leave this hulk, Glenn said, as Caitlin made to plug in the auxiliary unit. What the hell? Caitlin called out moments later, making Glenn shift his focus from the asteroid field to seeing her completely shook, an almost pale ghostly white reaction spread across her face. What? What is it? He asked. The download. What about it? Glenn said curiously. It's running, Caitlin said, completely shook. That's fast, Glenn returned, knowing they would be leaving sooner than he thought. No, Glenn, you don't get what I'm saying. I haven't even plugged in the unit yet, and download's halfway done, Caitlin told him, showing him the power unit still unplugged in her hand. How's that possible? You couldn't get a connection beforehand, Glenn asked. Glenn, I don't know, but I'm seriously starting to get freaked out here. 
Caitlin replied. Caitlin, plug in the unit. See if you can find the ship's onboard footage. We need to find out what happened here, Glenn said, watching Caitlin plug in the unit. As she did, the console on the cockpit started to come to life. Taking the front seat of the Callisto, Glenn scrolled through the files on the Callisto until he found the ship's security footage. Quickly, he found what he was looking for. Caitlin, I think I found the footage. He called over to her, waiting until she joined him before playing it. They both watched on in horror of the final few moments of Haley Dalton as she made her way back onto the Callisto and sat on the floor at the rear of the Callisto before taking off her suit, discarding it. Caitlin was about to say something, but as they watched on, they came to the final few moments as Haley uncoupled the Callisto, setting it on its course before she had met her fate at the hands of the invisible assailant. My God, Glenn said, feeling extremely uncomfortable in the chair, knowing that this was where Haley had died. That was horrifically brutal. Just what was that? Caitlin asked, completely shook and horrified. It was the sound of bleeping from the science console that snapped them back out of their stupor. Quickly, Caitlin checked it. Glenn, the download! She yelled to him. What? More bad news? Glenn asked. The download isn't going to our ship. The Callisto is downloading our files to itself. She told him, the fear and panic overtaking her. That's impossible, Glenn snapped, jumping out of the chair and looking at the science console, not wanting to believe what she was saying. But as he saw the information himself, he had to. Just what did they download from listening post 22? A computer virus or something? He said. A computer virus doesn't kill people, but... Caitlin spoke quickly accessing the Callisto's files, tracing back a path, starting with the listening post. I think they unknowingly downloaded a computer virus from the listening post when they were trying to find out what happened there themselves. Best guess, the crew were all dead before they arrived, Caitlin told Glenn. Great. So we've got an abandoned infected listening post right in the path between the Sol system and Proxima Centauri. Glenn said. The last ship to visit the listening post was the DSV Wheeler. Before that, it had come from Mars Jump Point on Phobos. Glenn, they conduct tests in mechanical robotics for colony construction without the need for people. My God, you know what this means? Caitlin said, her tone changing. Fill me in quick. It's not only a computer virus, but I think whatever happened to the Listening Post crew and the Daltons was an out-of-control nanite attack, Caitlin said. Fill me in. What's a nano night? Glenn asked. A microscopic computer that rewrites any organic structure, turning it into something else, on request. Glenn! It's airborne. We wouldn't have known, Caitlin told him. But if it's a computer virus, that doesn't explain why it's drifting out here, Glenn asked. It does if it didn't know how to navigate the belt safely without help or data, Caitlin told him. And we're giving it what it wants, Glenn spoke, making to rush off the cockpit and back to the Trent. Yet as he did... The cockpit door slammed shut. Damn you! I'm not giving you what you want, he said, prizing his fingers into any nook he could in the doorframe to open it. Yet somehow he knew this would be a running battle back to the Trent, but he had to stop this computer virus. Caitlin, see... 
if you can disable the download, he said, managing to gain a hold, pulling the doors backwards. Wait, Glenn, Caitlin called out to chase after him, but the doors once again closed, moments after he had got through. Caitlin! Caitlin! Glenn balked, banging on the door, trying to open it from his side, but it wouldn't budge. Knowing what he had to do, he turned to get back to the Trent. Strangely enough, this computer virus either didn't care or didn't have full control of the Callisto systems as he rushed through back onto the Trent with ease. Making his way back onto the bridge of the Trent, he furiously typed in a series of commands trying to stop the download, seeing it was at 93% complete. He found a command for a system purge and full restart, and wasted no time in activating it. Glenn, you did it. The system stopped, Caitlin said. Took a full f shutdown and purge, but I think we saved everyone. Once I get you back over here, we'll undock and make sure no one ever finds the Callisto again. Followed up with a report to Luna Gateway about this he said, giving himself a moment to catch himself. Wait, lad. Something's wrong. The Callisto sh just shut and locked the docking hatch, and... Glenn, the downloads just started back up again, Caitlin said, her words sounding frantic. Glenn turned the system back on, his eyes widening in shock and horror before coming to a realization. That's not all it's done. It's activated the Trent's auto-destruct. I'm trapped, Glenn said. Can't you stop it? Systems locked me out during restart. As he spoke, he looked out the window, noticing that the Callisto was now looking at the Trent face to face, like a predator, observing its prey ready for the kill. He then watched as the Callisto pulled further away, with Caitlin in the cockpit area, trying to access and wrestle back control, but being unsuccessful. Caitlin. Caitlin. Look at me, he said, his words now calm and measured, waiting, as she looked at him, ship to ship. I'm sorry. I'm sorry we never had the best of friendships. But I hope you manage to get back control. And I'm sorry. I was never honest with you about my past. The station wasn't just my posting, but my home. I, um, I made a mistake back on Luna Gateway. A mistake that got me posted out here. I accidentally cost a life. My girlfriend, the Gateway's commander, Mary Holloway. No. When you get back to Luna Gateway, tell them. Tell them I'm sorry, Glenn said before turning off suit transmission, watching now as the Callisto was getting farther and further away. Damn you. Damn you! Ah! Caitlin watched on in horror as the Trent erupted in an explosive fireball. She turned away from the window, sobbing. If you think I'm gonna let you get back to Luna Gateway and Earth with what you're carrying, forget it. I'll stop you. You just killed a good man. And soon, everyone will know about it. She snapped, placing a data drive into the science station console. This message will go with you to Luna Gateway, warning them of you and your nanonites. And don't bother trying to corrupt it. It's encrypted. And this auxiliary power unit 
will make sure of it. So go ahead and do your worst. Caitlin yelled out to the Callisto. As if on command and in rage, the ship powered backwards at top speed, lurching her forwards off her feet in an attempt to break her spacesuit helmet. When that proved unsuccessful, it quickly powered forwards, throwing her against the cockpit doors. This time, Caitlin let out a smile before the ship powered backwards. This time, as her spacesuit helmet hit the console base, it developed a hairline fracture. Moments later, Caitlin could feel a tingling sensation running over her face, and then the feeling of pain before she blacked out.